I'm naked from the waist down, so I won't be getting up now. I'll... Excellent choice. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Give me the give me the big signal. Are we ready? Okay. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are live in this Google chat. My name is Eric Cavanaugh, CEO of the Bloor Group. I'm here with a couple esteemed guests. We may have another guest who will join us as well. I'm very excited to be part of the Visualization Fireside Chat. This is hosted by Skytree, so a big thanks to our friends at Skytree. Frankly, it's one of the most interesting companies I've come across in the last couple of years. They do machine learning. There are all kinds of applications for this technology. Really, it can be used in just about any way your imagination takes you. Of course, machine learning is pretty specific in terms of what it can get done, but like I say, there's a really broad array of use cases for this technology, so it's worth looking into. And of course, today, we're talking about big data visualization. So is big data visualization possible? That's the title of the show today. We have a couple guests, as I mentioned. We're going to hear from Leland Wilkinson. He's a PhD and VP of data visualization at Skytree. We're also going to hear from Tamara Munzner. She is a doctor over at uh, the professor, I'm sorry, at the University of British Columbia. Both of them data visualization experts. And we may hear from John Stasco. He was having some technical issues logging in. He is also a professor over at Georgia Institute of Technology. So I think what we'll do, first of all, is I'll just say a couple quick things. Is big data visualization possible? Well, I certainly think so. I certainly think that it is. Keep in mind, though, that uh, the techniques used for visualizing big data are going to be a little bit different than traditional data for all kinds of reasons, not just the volume, but also the nature of the data itself. And of course, you have to consider what you're trying to accomplish. So there are a number of different techniques you can use. Obviously, we'll talk about some of those today. And one of the themes that we're going to try to home in on is essentially, basically, how do you know which kind of data visualization technique to use? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And maybe let's kind of go around the room and get some introductions from each of our guests. And they're going to tell you a bit about themselves and then talk about some kind of data visualization that gets them excited. So first of all, let's kind of go in this order. Leland Wilkinson, otherwise known as Lee, I'll throw it over to you first. What are your thoughts on big data visualization? Well, like you, I think it can be done. Um, it requires uh, some additional processing from what we usually do for smaller data sets. And some of that involves techniques that are used in machine learning, uh, some of it statistics. Um, but uh, yes, indeed, I do, I, I believe it's possible. Okay, tell us something a bit about uh, what got you, you into visualization. What first struck you? Because you're not new to this territory, right? You've been doing it since long before it was cool in the enterprise software world. Well, I, I had a, a number of fortuitous events. I, I work at the intersection of psychology, statistics, and computer science. Technically, I'm a statistician, but I got into visualization pretty early because in the 1980s, I wrote a statistics package called uh, Sysdat, and uh, in the mid-80s, I wrote a, a scientific visualization system to go to work in SysDat. And I began to discover regularities in the way graphs are specified. And eventually worked after about 10 years. I uh, worked on a book, um, and <laughs> which may come close to matching the amount of time Tamara spent on her latest book. But in any case... Uh, it was called The Grammar of Graphics, and uh, I, it, it related to the mathematical underpinnings of visualizations. Uh, and then from there, I, I went on to, to work on a variety of methods for visualizing big data. And, and I'd just been very lucky to have had a background in all three fields uh, starting in about 1970, I'm afraid to say. That's when I first started <laughs> programming computers. Wow, that's a long time. But you understand, of course, that the fundamentals of programming don't much change. But this machine learning stuff is pretty, it's pretty fascinating. Do you want to give us just like a quick minute on machine learning and how it kind of plays in the whole big data space? Well, I do like to, I'm one of the people who believes there's a difference between statistics and machine learning. Um, uh, machine learning is about prediction, and we try to develop models, uh, we sometimes call those non-parametric models, that are very good at making predictions. These are deep learning neural networks, these are uh, random forests and all sorts of you know, boosting and so on. And um, the, the, they, it is 
quite naturally lent itself to big data issues. Uh, statistics, on the other hand, is more about making judgments about particular models and inferring things. So uh, machine learning has brought some tremendous stimulation to the field of statistics, and uh, it's a very interesting interaction. Okay, good. Well, let's go around and meet our other guests, and then we'll kind of dive into some examples. Let's go over to Tamara Munzner from University of British Columbia. Dr. Munzner, welcome to the show. Tell us a bit about yourself. Hi. Uh, thanks. It is fun to be here. Um, now that you've seen my bright and shining face, I'm actually going to switch over to some slides and be slide-rific here. Uh, so... Um, there you go. All right. Excellent. So, yeah, I'm at the UBC, the University of British Columbia, up in Canada. Um, I can't claim to be doing viz for as long as Lee has, but I have been doing it for a little while, almost 25 years now. Um, and I actually got the viz bug bit me right when I left undergrad. Um, I ended up at a pretty magical place called the Geometry Center, which was this vortex of visualization meets mathematics, um, particularly geometry and topology. And so we ended up doing a lot of software, not just for three-dimensional space, but also four-dimensional space and non-Euclidean geometries like hyperbolic space. Uh, did some movies about things like um, what would it be like to live in a space that was finite but had no boundaries? Uh, how do you turn a sphere inside out without poking a hole or creasing it, but if you've got this sort of uh, interesting material that's allowed to self-intersect? Um, and so after several years of this, I decided, A, I love visualization, and B, I think I need a PhD in order to go do this anywhere else. So. I ended up at Stanford uh, for about five years doing a PhD, and I went from visualization in order to help people understand mathematics to visualization, in some cases, using interesting math in service of abstract data. So this idea of non-Euclidean geometry and hyperbolic space, I ended up getting into layout of large trees and networks in hyperbolic space, and that led me to realize, hey, there's this field. It's called visualization, and people think about this more generally. Um, so as part of some of the stuff I did with my PhD, I ended up working with folks like computational linguists, doing some custom layouts of uh, subsets of very, very large graphs, uh, in this case an online dictionary. Um, and then after a few years, a few years at a research lab, uh, I ended up at UBC, and these days I really try to do a mix of things, from work that's very much oriented towards techniques to work that's more oriented towards, here's a user with a bunch of data and a problem, how do I help them? Um, and then evaluating. I'm not going to focus too much on things like controlled experiments in the lab today or field studies, but I do quite a lot of that. And then I try to have all of these fit together into some areas of theoretical foundations, trying to pull it all together and say, how do we do visualization better? Um, so when I actually start out, uh, I've been working on a book, as Lee mentioned, for the last six years, and it's finally almost available. It'll be out there in November. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about what is visualization and when do we do it? And the definition I like these days is computer-based visualization systems help provide visual representations of data sets designed to help people carry out tasks more effectively. So there's a bunch of words in there that are interesting, um, but let's think when is viz suitable? And I'm going to say viz instead of visualization to save myself some syllables. I don't mean computer vision. Uh, I mean any combination of information visualization, scientific visualization, visual analytics. I'll just say viz for all of that. So viz is suitable when there's a need to augment the human rather than replace people with some kind of computational decision-making method. Now, that's, of course, an interesting thing to say when we're in uh, a machine learning kind of a setup at SkyTree. So what's the relationship between these? Well, there are situations where there really is a human in the loop who needs details. And classically, that's when you don't know what questions to ask in advance. If you knew exactly what to ask, great. You would write a custom algorithm. You'd uh, run some kind of ML. But there's a lot of situations where you don't actually know precisely what. That might be some kind of long-term analysis, for example, exploratory data analysis for a scientific application. It might be that you do want to automate, but you're not there yet. Maybe the visit is a stepping stone towards model building, or you're refining your algorithms, or even you've got an automatic system that you want to deploy, but you really want to make sure you trust it first. So you need some kind of human monitoring and oversight, either temporarily or in the long run. Um, this might be for presentation, things like you're seeing in the New York Times. So in general, the play with viz is that you're trying to augment the human by swapping in perception for cognition anytime you can. Um, and there's a continuing theme that you're not just worried about the data, you're worried about the task. What's the user trying to do? What do they need to know to make their decision or get their job done? And we focus a lot on this question of 
what is an effective visualization. So just to give you some intuition for why it is that we want to show data to people, I'm going to give you a tiny example that shows where summaries fall short, in particular statistical summaries. So often people need to not just rely on the summary, but either confirm that the model's working as expected or find something unexpected, or you've got a model and you want to figure out if you believe it. So there's this fantastic data set um, by the statistician Anscombe from the early 70s, where he's got four data sets that have identical mean and variance and correlations and so on, and so you can't tell them apart from simple summary statistics. The instant I show you a picture, you can tell them apart. Uh, and you can start to see where things are linear versus nonlinear, where the regression line is pretty good versus a little not so great versus utterly pessimal because of this interesting synthetic uh, uh, state of affairs down in the lower right hand corner. So this gives you the idea for tiny data sets of 20 dots. So things, of course, get worse when we have more than 20 dots, when we have 20,000 or 2 million or 2 billion. So what are some things we can do there? Um, I'm just going to really briefly say, give you an overview of the kinds of things I care about. Uh, I do a lot with looking at networks. So questions about how do we scale up the kind of network drawing I started doing in my PhD, and I continue now that as a professor, things like chop them up into pieces that are meaningful, so topologically aware decomposition and layout and browsing. And typically, those are in the realm of around between 10,000 and 100,000, which is pretty big by visualization standards if you really are trying to draw a meaningful picture, not just a giant hairball. How do you compare huge trees uh, with millions of nodes in a way that you don't just rely on the graphics card to do the right thing, which throws away tiny marks, assuming that they're distant objects? Maybe those have really deep semantic meaning. So how do we build software infrastructures for letting you make sure that all the marks that are meaningful are actually visible to you on the screen? Um, by the way, as I'm going along, uh, I'll be flashing up a lot of pictures, and then there's system names, and typically there's a YouTube link right there uh, where people that are interested in following up uh, can just go because our group has uploaded pretty much all our videos um, onto YouTube, so for your later browsing pleasure. Um, other stuff, actually one of the most close connections between visualization and machine learning is this area of dimensionality reduction, going from very high dimensional data sets projecting down to lower dimensions. Um, and this is actually a place where at the algorithm there is very direct overlap. Uh, so we've worked a lot in this area, trying to do multidimensional scaling in parallel on the GPU, worrying about what happens when the distance measure itself is high cost, um, some work that's even going to be published in a machine learning uh, journal on how to go for very sparse document data sets to get high quality layouts for millions of items. So. But I don't just do algorithms and techniques. I also try to dive in and say, here's a user. They have data. They have tasks. What the heck should we do? How can we design a visualization for this? And typically, their data sets are, comp are heterogeneous. Um, so I've done a lot in genomics um, with a few different systems uh, for things like seeing how chromosomes move around between species, looking at gene expression data and matching it up with what's known about how genes interact, um, studying the genetic basis of leukemia. So, but I work in a lot of other domains as well, uh, ranging from system management to in-car overlay networks to fisheries management, um, and our latest system that we're particularly enthused about is for investigative journalists. Um, so lots, lots more info. Uh, my own groups page has a lot of both uh, free software, uh, all these videos I mentioned, a lot of papers to follow up, and these talk slides themselves are also up. So that's the quick overview of what I care about these days. Well, that's, that's fantastic stuff. Well, let's get to our final guest. We do, in fact, have John Stasco, a doctor, a professor, I should say, Dr. John Stasco from Georgia Institute of Technology. So, John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to swap over to my slides and uh, get going. So, I'm a professor here at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. I got my Ph.D in computer science at Brown uh, in 1989 and in the 25 years since I've been here at Georgia Tech. I think I've been interested in visualization in an in indirect way since I was a kid. I was always a statistics, numbers, baseball, box scores kind of guy and then as I got older I just I kind of believe it when I see it and I think that naturally evolved into it and my thesis work was in this area and I've just kind of continued to do it since then. Um, I wanted to, to address, you know, the, the key question we were looking at here, the kind of visualization for big data and what it's all about and can that work. And I'm going to give it a qualified yes, <laughs> kind of partly maybe. And, you know, if you think about it, truly big data, we're talking big, big, you know, terabyte, petabyte kind of thing and visualization, we've got the screen, maybe 
maybe you have multiple screens we want to show. And at some level, you've got a bit of a square peg in a round hole, right? You've got more zeros on the one side. If, if you know, 10 to the 15 chunks of information need to go into only a million pixels, that's not going to work in just a direct mapping. But we can do things to kind of with visualization to really help out. So we need to aggregate data items or filter, sample, project, things along those lines. And this really has led to kind of a new, it's not really an area, but a new notion of this idea of visual analytics, where we have to combine things like machine learning and data mining with human-directed interactive visualization to really help people uh, with decision making when the data sets get big and when they get very complex. And I think, as Tamara was saying before, that's a really good match for big data, right? Because I think big data situations are many where I don't even know what to look for. I'm not sure what's possibly in there. So, you know, visualization is a good fit for that. So I think with these kind of appropriate uh, augmentations and assistances with visualization, it, it can help out an awful lot. Um, to give you a little bit of a flavor for the kind of things I do and, and in my group some of the work, um, my biggest project the past six or seven years has been a system called Jigsaw that's all about helping people who have, co you know, collections, fairly large collections of documents, say in the thousands, things like police case reports or consumer reviews, who want to understand them. And we combine text mining, text analytics with a lot of different visualizations in this system, and we uh, give it away at the URL above, and a lot of different people and organizations have used it. Um, I do some work on just fundamental techniques. The, the upper one is visualizing different sets of data. Here those are um, blood samples from whale sharks and whether particular compounds are in certain samples or not. The bottom left one is a system called Sunburst that's about hierarchical data. Things like uh, family, his, family uh, ancestries or your files on your computer. Um, I do some work with businesses and, and, and thinking about business applications for visualizations, a lot of times things like dashboards and drill down informatics. Um, all the way lately, I'm a big sports fan, so we've been doing visualization of sports data. Um, you know, we have all the, the shots from a hot day NHL in one season or all of a PGA Tour golf and basketball and things like that, and I have some fun projects that students have been doing. Uh, the last thing, we're now transforming, so what if you're your platform changes a little bit. You've got a tablet where you've got multi-touch and fingers rather than a keyboard and mouse. What are the right and the most effective set of interactive visualizations? I've been doing some work there too. Um, this website uh, summarizes uh, that stuff a little bit more and uh, I think that's a good point to kind of take it on back. Okay, great. Well, let's kind of go around the room and get a little bit deeper into what we're talking about. I guess I'll throw it back over to Lee. You know, just looking at some of those great examples we just saw, I, it reminds me of the challenge of deciding which kind of data visualization technique to use on which kind of data. Can you kind of talk about how you go about doing that or how you advise your clients to do that? Because it's an ongoing challenge, right? Well, uh, let me show you one example of uh, where I focused uh, a fair amount on scatter plots. Um, I'm going to just show you uh, what what possibilities exist for scatter plots. Uh, can you see this uh, visualizing big data? Yep, I sure can. Okay, um, so. Um, I've done this work with uh, my colleagues uh, Tuan Dung at uh, the Electronic Visualization Lab at uh, uh, Illinois and with Anushka Anand who's at Tableau Software. And um, the, the problem, this is a well-known problem, uh, you're trying to plot data and you've got um, a fair number of cases and you try to do a scatter plot. Um, this example shows only 100,000 uh, points and uh, it's taken from a Gaussian or a bivariate normal distribution and you really don't see anything going on in the center when in fact um, there's quite a concentration of points in the center. So what do we do with problems like this? One of the methods that was invented by Dan Carr a number of years ago is very clever. You can um, as John pointed out, you can aggregate data. 
Uh, and in fact, you can aggregate down to the pixel level. The problem with doing that is that it affects the distribution of points. And uh, depending on how you orient the little tiny squares, the result is going to look different. Um, Dan decided a really good way to tile the plane would be to use hexagons because they're pretty close to circles. They cover the plane, unlike circles, and they don't distort the orientation. So one thing Dan did was these hexagon densities that you see on the left. Um, and uh, uh, th there are several thousand points here. It's not huge, but of course it works with huge data sets. What I love about Dan, one of Dan's ideas, on the right, he puts a point at the at, not at the center of the hexagon, because if he had, you just would have seen this grid on the right that would look kind of like the left. Instead, he plots the point at the centroid of all the points inside that hexagon. It, it's the mean on, on uh, X and Y. And in doing so, he creates something that looks pretty close to the scatter plot that you would get by plotting all the data. It's a bit irregular, shows the density, and of course he sizes the circles by the number of cases uh, in that hexagon. So that's one approach that actually goes back a couple of decades. Um, another approach that I've uh, exploited quite a bit was an idea that John and Paul Tukey gave me in a, a tiny little workshop many years ago, and they never published it. And I later, after John died, I, I talked to Paul and asked, do you, do you mind if I go explore this, this problem, or do you plan to publish it? And he said, go right ahead. So John Tukey called this gagnostics. You know, he, he's the guy, he loved neologisms. He invented the word software. He also invented the word bit. Um, and this one is called scatterplot diagnostics. And what he did was he developed a general strategy for identifying shapes of points, which is really kind of cool. Um, I took off from there and used things called, uh, well, graph theoretic uh, algorithms. They are, they are geometric graphs you put on a set of points that you can compute pretty quickly. And in doing so, you can identify features like outlyingness. Uh, does the scatter plot have a bunch of outliers? Um, are they clumpy? See in the third row there that on the right is something that's very clumpy. It has a scagnostic value of almost one. And on the left is something that's not at all clumpy and it has a scagnostic clumpy value of almost zero. So anyway, you compute these things. There's a fair amount of math underlying it, but it really doesn't matter. You can see how these shapes are identified. Now let's say you use these scagnostics, you've now reduced um, a huge number of scatter plots to a relatively small number of features for each scatter plot, and you can then visualize them. So here's one thing uh, we did uh, involving what we called a scagnostic explorer. We computed the scagnostics for a whole bunch of scatter plots. Then we um, used methods for laying them out and also for um, if you see in the far right here, exploring similar plots, we were able to identify exemplars. You can think of those uh, as little clusters uh, that are like those points that were in the hexagon binning. In other words, you could have thousands of scatter plots represented by just one scatter plot. And I'll show you an example um, uh, as we go. Here, here's an example with a particular data set that had 8,000 scatter plots. And what is happening is the program is clustering these and moving them into, uh, in two dimensions on each individual scagnostic. So we chose monotonic and all the scatter plots that are monotonic, you know, that, that lie pretty close to a curve, are on the right. Here's one where we chose outlying and you notice that reddish one on the right had outliers. Um, here we did outlyingness versus monotonic to, to get a scatter plot of scatter plots. Now, um, here's another example that identifies a scatter plot in a relatively large data set that is an outlier. And it's one that has uh, 
is very monotonic. This came out of a UC Irvine, a Cal Irvine, California collection of data sets where it was constructed to be the needle in the haystack, and this method finds it. Here's a real data set uh, involving breast cancer, and we are exploring similar scatter plots. Notice the striped ones at the top. And when we highlight, you notice all the similar scatter plots appear in this circle around the exemplar scatter plot. So we're able to represent a huge number of scatter plots in a much simpler display. Finally, one day I, I spoke to my grad student who was Tuan, who was working on his dissertation, and we were talking about various ideas he had, and I said, you know, actually a picture can be converted to a scatter plot. Why don't you go with that and see what happens? And he did, and I, it, it's a very exciting dissertation. Um, what he did was to take a picture, and there's, um, in this case, um, the logo of the Visit Norway um, <laughs> uh, tourist uh, symbol, and Tuan decomposed it into scatter plots by taking the hue, saturation, and brightness aspects of the images and coded them according to various intervals, so um, on each of these dimensions. So uh, in the end, uh, his program clusters in real time pictures. And this example here is taken from uh, 65,000 or so pictures. Uh, and notice that in the corner in the left, I don't think you can see what they are, but they're all the dinosaurs. Um, Using Skagnostics plus a few other features, this program is capable of clustering and pulling out pictures that are related to each other. And it turns out when you process the data this way, to the best we've been able to determine, at least for published results, this is the fastest way to cluster images that's uh, known at this time. So that gives you a few ideas of what can be done with something as simple as a scatter plot. Um, Tamara has done, I, I think she showed you an example, starting with her dissertation, very similar things with ginormous trees and graphs that ordinarily would look like hairballs. And I think the same principles apply. So uh, maybe she'll comment on that uh, in more detail later. Thank okay, you. that's great. And if you don't mind, I want to ask you a couple quick questions. First of all, I love that you showed some of those visualizations in motion. It seems to me a static image can obviously provide a tremendous amount of perspective, and that's what we're trying to find here is perspective. But when you show things in motion, that has an, another whole dimension of time and movement. That's a very useful technique for kind of understanding what's happening in the data, right? Yes, I agree. You know, in, in the visualization group, and I'm sure uh, John and Tamara would agree, there was a time when uh, animations and motion were looked dis on askance. You know, it, it, it just is, you shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> I think in the last, well, I don't know, what would you say, maybe 10 years, there's a new realization that animation can convey a tremendous amount of information if it's done smoothly, coherently, uh, in the right way. So in that dinosaur example, it's really a blast. Um, uh, if you look at Tuan Dong's website, uh, D-A-N-G, by the way, we'll provide that, I think, through Skytree, but you can see these dinosaurs moving as they get clustered uh, in a force-directed uh, algorithm. And so I, I just love animations. I've actually told people around here who work on visualizations, I want every one of our visualizations to jiggle. <laughs> That's pretty good stuff. And one more comment. I love the way that Hexagon really helped crystallize that one particular image I recall learning many years ago. There are some theorists who believe that the hexagon is the perfect shape, and their rationale kind of revolved around the architectural integrity of the hexagon. And I, so I thought it was really kind of interesting that uh, in this context it did such a good job of kind of getting rid of the downsides of the blurriness, if you will, of a visualization and really helping to crystallize and, and kind of concretize that image. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yes, um, I should point out, by the way, that Dan Carr went on to work with NASA 
to tile the sphere with hexagons. And he pointed out, a lot of geographers know this, latitude longitude is a very bad way to tile the, the sphere because you, you can work with projections of it, but up at the poles, you are undersampling areas. And if you really want to sample for things like weather data and so on, you should be sampling on hexagons. Unfortunately, so much technology at NASA was set up to do it the other way and elsewhere that we still persist in tiling the sphere with lat lawn uh, coordinates in, in a rectangular uh, projection onto the sphere. Andrew, that's interesting. It goes to show you can have great ideas, but sometimes uh, there is a certain inertia in large organizations that's hard to overcome. And I think that a lot of people out there, maybe in our audience, have kind of experienced that. But keep up the good work, keep up the ideas, and, and the good ones will get through. Uh, and with that, let's bring in Tamara again. Um, Lee kind of mentioned something about this visualization in motion and animations. What are your thoughts on that? And then I'd like to learn a lot more about some of the examples you put up there, especially the one for journalists. But first of all, animations and visualiza visualizations in motion. What do you think about that? I think it's complicated. Um, and uh, so I think there are some situations where animation is exactly the right thing, um, particularly any kind of animated trans transition. If you start in one state, you want to end up in another state and have objects move between them instead of having a jump cut. So basically what you're doing is you're providing object constancy so that people don't have to figure out how did this get to here. You actually see them move. It gets tricky if you really have many states and you have changes happening all over. And in that situation, I think animation can can be a little more dangerous and then often people go with things like side by side views so there tends to be this this design space of possibilities where animation is one of them uh, side by side views are another um, explicitly computing differences and showing those exactly are another so there tends to be this trade off I personally I don't know if I'd go to say we want everything to jiggle it's pretty <laughs> hard then to to look away in fact there's a lot of, of graph layouts where um, for structured layout, which is the idea that you're kind of having, you're simulating a spring system and you're treating it like an optimization problem and getting things to sort of settle and converge. Um, there's a lot of people who have built simple versions of that, where at the end they end up sort of, you know, jiggling in a way that's, it's actually hard to move your eyes away from it, whether or not it's important. So mm. any motion is always tricky. If you want it to be the main thing they look at, it's great. If you want them to be able to look at other things, then it can be sort of like crack for the eyes. Uh, you, you look at it whether you should or not. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's an interesting design space. That's good stuff. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and so I think you made a really good point, too, about dimensional reduction. That really is the key, isn't it? And, and frankly, um, I don't know if Lee wants to jump back in on this before we bring John out. Um, but, you know, dimensional reduction is really what you want to do in data mining because you want to find which are the key dimensions mapped against each other that are going to reveal the useful kinds of insights that we're looking for. So that, again, I think that's a brilliant point that you made uh, tomorrow, and I think it's central to the whole process of coming up with a good visualization, right, is figuring out which dimensions really matter and which are extraneous. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Lee. Well, I was just going to point out, by the way, that uh, the jiggle was a joke, but um, the program... Okay, wasn't sure. <laughs> but, but I also did mean in the UIs of the program. I think it's sort of like the USA Today example that uh, there are a lot of people who just like Ed Tufte who detest USA Today graphs, and <laughs> the, the hard research that's been done on that by people who really know what they're doing, uh, very fine psychologists, uh, has shown that it actually does, it isn't as bad as everybody says it is, that kind of quote chart junk. Um, really that issue of jiggling, from my point of view, was wherever it's useful to engage the viewer, people like that movement, but I agree completely with Tamara, There's, there are places like, uh, you know, graph layout and other things where it it's really not going to help that much. I do want to point, in, in answering your question, um, yes, that's the I think one of the intersections between um, analytics or statistics slash data mining and visualization, um, there's a major role you can play in uh, developing statistics, particularly in areas like nonlinear mapping, uh, uh, multidimensional scaling, principal components or singular value decompositions. 
where you can really take, in many cases, high-dimensional spaces in which there's a low-dimensional embedding of points and be able to see what's going on. So I, I agree with um, what Tamar and John have said. In terms of projections, it's one of the most important areas for dealing with high-dimensional space. Yeah, and actually riffing off what both John and Lee have said, this idea that basically dimensional reduction, that's like filtering for the dimensions. Um, that this idea, You can often think about filtering as either how do I filter the number of items I have to show or the number of attributes or dimensions or whatever we want to use to call that variables that we're actually then encoding in the data. Um, and so that's actually maybe a good segue into I've been working in dimensionality reduction from a number of different angles uh, for several years and there was a, an interesting saga of how to go from algorithms and techniques for doing that to actually solving real world problems where you've got people looking for needles in haystacks. So that's exactly that uh, question for journalists. Uh, do you want me to dive into that one? Yeah, go ahead. That'd be great. Okay, let me grab my screen share and... So, um, so the system that we called Overview uh, was an interesting evolutionary process. So the picture I showed you at the end was that last version uh, where people are looking at uh, these large collections of documents. But that's not the place we started. We, there were a bunch of questions, you know, here I've got lots of documents. What the heck is in them? Particularly for people working against the deadline, like reporters. So there's two questions we ended up realizing. There's how do you find the needle in the haystack? And how do you convince someone else that there is no specific needle in a haystack? That's actually an even harder problem if you're trying to convince people of that. And so I want to talk a little bit about how we went from a very first version, which was a research prototype, which had exactly this kind of dimensionality reduction where we reduced from high dimensional space down to low dimensional space. We constructed a particular um, tree representing all possible stages of hierarchical clustering, gave them an interface for actually looking at documents and taking a look at the keywords and such, and doing a lot of tagging. And so the question is, why did we move from this first interface then to actually quite a different interface? Um, and then finally, the fourth one that we had at the end. So let me actually talk you through that. Um, so to cast this as a superhero movie, uh, we have this origin story where WikiLeaks meets Glimmer. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, there's this guy, Jonathan Stray, who's this hacker journalist, where he said, you know, here we've got some WikiLeaks data. Let's analyze the Iraq war logs. Um, and he had this conjecture that there was a classification that came with the data, which were that these um, after-action reports did have categorizations, uh, a high-level one of about, you know, eight levels, things like there was friendly action versus a criminal incident. And he had this conjecture that there was really probably some very interesting mid-level structure in that data set that would not be apparent if you simply clustered according to this pre-existing classification. So the question was, could he actually investigate this? He had already done a lot of natural language processing on the data, and he wanted some better viz tools. And this is an example of one of his early um, visualizations to try to understand whether or not he could find this intermediate cluster structure. And he came across some of our own previous work that I'd mentioned, where we had worked really hard for what at the time we thought of as a very scalable system, um, which meant we could hit tens of thousands of documents very quickly. Um, and in this case, it was trying to do dimensionality reduction, multidimensional scaling, MDS, um, using the GPU to get some parallelism. So this was this WikiLeaks meets Glimmer. And the issue was, it helped. He could actually see some structure he didn't know before, but it still seemed like it wasn't really nailing things. So what to do? Um, and let me actually just give you some pictures to kind of paint in pictures what Lee said in words a minute ago um, using this sort of analysis framework that I'm fond of these days that I've built my book around where we really think about what and why and how. Um, so, and you can think about often a series of chain tasks. So you start out, think of it as a very, very high dimensional table. Uh, you've got many rows, which are your items. You've got many dimensions. And we want to go from this n dimensional space where n might be in the tens of thousands down to a really small number of dimensions, let's say one or two. And in particular, when we're doing visual dimensionality reduction, then what we're doing is we're saying, we are going to have a human who is looking at the projected data Often it's that they're plotting it as a scatter plot. They're trying to find clusters and then discover um, 
are the clusters we conjectured actually in there? Uh, what might they mean? So not just look at clusters, but actually say, after inspecting the data, I'm going to come up with a label for this cluster. So I'm really trying to annotate the data. Um, if folks are interested in some of these different ways of looking at DR from a very visualization-oriented perspective, uh, I've got a URL for a, a, a much longer talk uh, that goes into a whole bunch of work that we've done in this area. But I'm not going to focus on that today. Instead, what I'm going to do is keep on with this story of, so how did we design the system for the journalists? And thinking about this in terms of what and why and how. So why were they actually using this visualization tool? It was try to understand clusters, judge their quality, see if it was believable that something really was or wasn't a cluster. For the what, it was that we didn't just start out by saying, here's the documents, uh, or even here's a low dimensional space in which these documents reside. What we tried to do is then actually derive what are a bunch of possible clusterings and how do those clusterings change. Um, so we ended up, and a, a continuing theme, and this goes back to what John talked about, which is that with visual analytics and visualization in general, we often don't just draw the picture of what we're given in the first place. We take what we're given, we often do a lot of transformations of the data, um, and then we end up drawing pictures of that transformed data in a way that actually helps the user solve their problem. So here we were trying to help people. Originally, we thought of this as just let's explore the space of the possible clusterings. Um, and so we did this by actually showing things as a cluster hierarchy that was computed on top of that original data set. So thinking about this from the point of view of what kinds of data that is, well, we've now got tree data. Um, and with these kinds of networks, and in particular trees, then one of the tasks people do is understand topological structure. How are things connected? So, well, how do you actually show these kinds of things? As we've been talking about, there's a lot of different visualization methods. Um, in particular, one of the most crucial things in a visualization is how are you using spatial position to convey information. And one of the most popular ways of looking at network and tree data is by drawing them as these node link diagrams where you literally have nodes connected up with edges between them. Um, there's other methods as well. I'm not going to talk about them too much right now. Uh, we also wanted to support the idea that any single cluster wouldn't be the right answer. We should let people use this cluster structure as a scaffolding, but also assign their own tags either following the cluster structure or differing from it. And so the goal here was to actually end up with some annotations. Uh, so think of that as producing data along the way while using a visualization. So it could follow or it could cross-cut the hierarchy. The goal might just be to annotate or to figure out how far am I on the analysis? Have I seen everything yet? Um, or is there some structure that's in my head that I'm not yet seeing on screen and I want to somehow decant how I'm thinking onto some uh, way that I can then encode on the visualization? So I'm going to use the word idiom to talk about this this way that we have both drawn the picture, visually encoded it, and how do we interact with the picture. And often in visualization, the static picture and the way it changes as you interact are so intertwined that you can't necessarily separate them out. Uh, so a lot of visualization, as John said, is really focused on interaction. And really, this is also what Lee is saying, is static pictures are a place we start, but we typically don't end there. We almost always have some way of interacting. Um, and I mentioned before this idea that you could have multiple linked views side by side. Uh, and one way to link them, for example, is to use color coding that's the same across mm -hmm. these different uh, panels. Mm -hmm. So, for example, here in that original version I had on the right the cluster hierarchy, on the left I have this, sorry, on the right I have the scatter plot showing just the raw documents, the cluster hierarchy showing some of the structure, and then I can link between them by using color coding. Um, a lot of windows to show things like the actual documents. Anytime you've got text at the end of the day when people are actually looking at details, they do need to read stuff. So this is an example of this larger principle that there's ways of coordinating multiple views. It has to do with whether or not you're showing the same data in different ways on the multiple views or showing different data in the same way, for example. Uh, what are some ways you can visually encode data? I mentioned that spatial position is really important. Color code is great if you've got categorical data. Um, we, we, we've just been talking about motion. That's actually one way to encode data. You can have things that are wiggling. If carefully done, it can, in fact, be effective. You can shape code things. Uh, a lot of scatter plots, for example, you'll have your points where you've got shape coding. So there's a lot of these viz techniques. We're not going to have time to, to walk through them all. Um, but there's definitely a large design space of possibilities. Um, so what I want to give you some sense about this transformation is just what the look and feel was like of that first version. 
So I'm going to switch over to a different, um, so let me stop screen sharing for just a minute, switch over to a different window. Um, and uh, no, that is not the window of my dreams. <laughs> let me get another window. Um, ah, that is the window of my dreams. All right. So, and in this window, I'm not actually going to take the time to play the whole video, but I want to show you some sense of what's going on here with the user interaction. Notice how we've got um, a user that's moving back and forth between working with the cluster tree, seeing how things appear in the scatterplot view. Uh, it's a little hard to see because I've got the... Um, the, the scroll window over, but they're able to actually read the documents. So in this case, this was actually an uh, Associated Press Bureau Chief looking at the Caracas WikiLeaks data set um, mm. and trying to find some structure he didn't know, including some very interesting thing about uh, uh, aerial drones and uh, that mm. certainly a lot of people weren't aware of. So the question was, was this good enough? Um, let me actually switch back now to my slides. Uh, now that you've seen a little taste of what that look and feel was like. Um, and so, well, were we done? It turns out the answer is no, we weren't done. Uh, we originally might have thought we were done. So we had what we often have in a research paper. We had really focused on the algorithmic issues of how do you construct cluster hierarchies fast. It turns out that's an interesting and hard problem. We built a research prototype. You know, we had this, that because Jonathan Stray was uh, affiliated with the Associated Press, we were actually able to get a real journalist to try the system out. Um, but if we really wanted people to use it, it turned out that they just didn't, journalists are not the kind of people that are necessarily going to be hardcore technical sysadmin types, and just even installing and loading the software was tricky. Um, it turns out that we got some funding from the Knight Foundation to actually throw engineers at this, and so we were like, oh, I know, we can just solve this problem by having a web-based tool instead of a Java-based tool, and a lot of months of engineering went into making a new version and really focusing on usability, and we were really happy when a reporter did then publish a story where he looked into police corruption in Tulsa um, and used the system to find data. Now, the interesting thing is we actually ended up doing a lot more rounds of trying to think about this question of, well, which views are really helping them, and what exactly should we show in each view, and how should they work together, and it ended up being a lot of rounds of focusing not just on is this usable, but is it useful. And uh, along the way, a lot more people ended up doing stories. We were particularly happy when uh, there was a Pulitzer Prize finalist that actually used this, uh, looking at some of this police misconduct. Now. What's interesting, I'm going to switch back to the uh, video again just to give you a sense of the look and feel in version 4, and what I want to focus on is that things have actually changed a lot. We're not even showing that scatter plot of dimensionally reduced data. Um, we're really emphasizing the nodes in the tree rather than the links. Um, so to give you a very quick sense of that, and how am I doing on time? I want to be wrapping up pretty soon, yes? Yeah, just a couple more seconds, then we'll hand it over to John. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, right, so here's our, yeah, go ahead. All right, so here's our final video. Um, <laughs> is that really what's really <laughs> happening? I don't I think so. I love that visualization. I, I think no. you've got a visual example of two mirrors facing each other right yes. there. <laughs> yes. Let us do the screen share that I had in mind. Um, that was exciting, though. That's a good visualization to uh, keep the audience on their toes. Infinite dimensionality. <laughs> Right. So, just to you know, briefly show that, um, what does this final version look like? It's actually much more focused on the interior structure of these cluster hierarchies. Here's an example of going through some documents um, from a Freedom of Information Act request. So, hopefully I can do this right this time, just to wrap up where we're going with this. Um, no, that's it's all very useful stuff, though. That's a good view, and that's a very difficult thing to visualize when you're talking about what we typically refer to as unstructured data, because you have semantic issues, you have all these dimensional issues. It's not a very easy thing to navigate, so I can see why it would take a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of iterations, and that whole iterative process really is central to getting value from data visualization, getting value from data. Yeah. Um, what we found at the end of the day was that we really had some 
very different tasks. It ended up being that if you've got a set of leaked documents, like in WikiLeaks, then you've got questions like, what's even in here? Whereas if you end up with a Freedom of Information Act request dump, which what a lot of uh, journalists have, then you end up much more saying, um, not just what's in here, but where is this thing I'm looking for? Uh, so I think I'm over time enough that I'm not going to actually get into this whole idea of an abstract way to think about tasks. Um, but I just want you to think about the fact that it's even harder to prove that the needle's not in the haystack than to find that needle. And in that example of the Pulitzer Prize winning request, they were actually trying to show that the government of New York had not passed any bills that were focusing on police misconduct. So they had to look through a huge amount of data and convince themselves before they could write a story. It turns out they did a huge amount of work for one sentence in the story, which was, there were no bills passed addressing this issue. That was actually weeks of work to make that sentence happen. Um, so uh, lots more going off on that. Uh, for people that are interested, I just want to get that URL up uh, for the project. Uh, and there was just a story last week about John McCain and condors, interestingly enough. Good stuff, all good stuff. And uh, Dr. Stasco, you've been very patient in the background there, so I'm sure you've got some interesting things to share with us. Why don't you just kind of dive in and say what strikes you or what are some good examples of good data visualization or even bad? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, I think you asked an interesting question before about kind of how do you know what type of visualization to use for a particular problem, right, or, or the data that you have. I, I really think of that in a way is kind of informed design creativity. It's it's hard to get away from some notion of, you know, there's an artistic creative sense that, that comes to part of it, but hopefully it's it's informed from a course like the one that Tamara teaches or the one that I teach where we explore what kind of techniques have been built for certain types of data be it temporal data, be it hierarchical data, be it networked data, as you said, maybe kind of qualitative unstructured data versus very quantitative numeric data. Um, there are a lot of visualization techniques out there. Some work a little better than others. There's no perfect recipe. There's no perfect algorithm. This viz is, you know, right for this problem. I think a lot of people want that kind of, you know, throw the data in, press the button, and boom, out pops the right thing, and it just it just doesn't quite work like that. Uh, you you start, you know, we, we we go based on some of the knowledge we know. We build a, a visualization, or maybe we mock it up on paper, and then as you saw through through some of the examples Tamara was giving, you've got to go back and forth with the stakeholders, the the people who have that data, and you know, a lot of times they don't know what they want, they don't know what they're looking for, but when you show them something, they can start to tell you if it's what they want and, and it may have germs of that and then they'll start making suggestions. Oh, and I want to know more about, you know, does this really correlate with that or, or does this go greater in the winter season when we're worried about the following thing? And then the visualization designer can bring in some aspect of that. Um, ultimately, when you have data, a lot of data, and you're trying to show it, you've got three choices of, of what you need to do. You can build a complex visualization that tries to bring as many variables in and just show it all in one view. And that's that's hard as the number of attributes goes anywhere of any size. It's just difficult. So then kind of alternatives two and three. Two is we use multiple views. We use multiple different coordinated representations that each may show some aspect of the data you get at it. The, the third method is really to use, as we've talked about, interaction. So I can't show everything, but by clicking and choosing and selecting and filtering, I can look at different portions of the data, and it leads me to kind of feel like I have a dialogue and I interact with it. At some point, there's just too much to show, and that's kind of our <laughs> fundamental problem we're dealing with, and so we have to compensate. We have to provide mechanisms to assist with that, and one of the key things visualization can do in interaction is free people from having to learn complicated query languages and, pro and and your interaction, you know, your query becomes, I click on something, you know, and I change it. And people can do that. That's easy. Even executives can do that. Um, but, you know, we can, you know, those are the kind of things that, that become much more natural and, and, and al allow a visualization, I think, to be used by a wider set of people. 
Yeah, that's great stuff. Those are really good perspectives. And I think you just spoke to what Tamara was talking about and also what Lee was mentioning, which is the fact that we're talking about a process here. There's not a static moment when everything is finished and you just go home and quit your job. No, this goes on and on and on. and You have to keep talking to people. And, and I think I like the way Tamara talked about the sort of abstraction of, of jobs or of, of questions or of processes because you really do, whoever is in your organization building these visualizations, you want them to be very interested and engaged in the business. And I think, John, to your point, you want them to be interacting with the business people on an ongoing basis, right? This is really central to the success paradigm, if you will, in this whole space is you must have these people interacting with the business people on a regular basis, not just once a month, but almost daily or at least once a week or something like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in visualization, one key difference from a lot of other data and data analysis tech, there's a human in the loop, right? There's a person driving this thing. Right. And that makes it for certain problems, maybe that's not the way you want to go. You do want to just press a button. But I think in situations where there's some decision making under uncertainty, that's a really nice situation where, right, I, I want a human in there and the visualizations are just tools. They're power tools. They're microscopes. They're telescopes to help that person maybe think a little more clearly or better, but, but the human's still driving and the human's making the decision about buy this, not this, or let's go here, or let's not go there. Uh, those kind of situations, I think, really speak to visualization. Yeah, that's all great stuff. Well, folks, we've almost burned through an entire hour here. Maybe let's kind of go around the room and get some closing comments from folks. And I wanted to mention something that uh, Tamara had said. I wrote this down, and you all had really, really good quotes. So I got a number of them that have tweeted. We've had some good tweet chat going online right now, which, of course, is great stuff. But uh, Tamara said, use the cluster structure as scaffolding. And, Lee, I'll kind of throw this out to you. That reminded me of one of my favorite philosophers who actually said something in his one of his books that is perfect. It's like a mantra for data visualization where he said, some things cannot be said, they must be shown. And he talked about in this book where he said, I want you to use these elucidations almost as a ladder to get up to the clouds and then kick the ladder away. And his point was, you want to use these tools to kind of facilitate the creative process and the understanding process and then not be too tied to them, not have your feet so uh, attached to the ground that you can kind of play around up in the sky of ideas somewhere. But what do you think about that, Lee? I, I do very much agree. Um, I, I would say my most important mentor throughout uh, my professional life has been John Hartigan, the statistician at Yale. And John um, did probably the classic book on clustering, uh, clustering algorithms. It's influenced uh, uh, just decades of research in the area. John's a Bayesian, but I asked him what, why the fascination with cluster analysis, and he said, understanding clustering leads to an understanding of the deepest problems in statistics. So I'm intrigued at Tamara's comment. I, I, I think it's uh, very consistent with what John has said. Um, and uh, I guess, from my point of view, my clustering is the most interesting statistical algorithm I've ever worked with. There, there are hundreds of clustering algorithms, and uh, they go very deep. Yeah, that's great stuff. And uh, Tamara, so any kind of closing thoughts from you or advice to, to folks about how to use these technologies and techniques? Um, just one is that there's a great recent paper uh, by I think it's Grimmer and King that talk about how no single clustering can actually answer all questions. Um, and uh, but back to Viz itself, there's a, uh, I mean, one of the big goals of visualization often is to work itself out of a job, where the goal is to help you understand the data set enough that maybe then you can do something in a more automated way. But the reason that we're not all going to be on the streets begging for food is there will always be more complex data sets. We can always go one level higher. So I think anytime you think about augmenting a human and expanding the set of what can be automated, I think visualization is crucial because there's some, you know, people that are studying the, gen the things like the genetic basis of leukemia 
there's not going to be the cure cancer button that they hit anytime soon. So they're going to be doing a lot of exploratory analysis and looking at complex questions. So I think we'll always be able to do the next step, which is why I'm not worried that automation is going to replace this. I think they actually go hand in hand in a really interesting and powerful way. Yeah, that's great stuff. And John, I'll uh, let you have the final word here talking sure. about... I, oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I, a natural analog here. So I'm not... When people explain abstract things to me, so I'm not the sharp, you know, I can't always pick up and get it. So I like to have my students around, I'm like, give me an example, right? Show, show me what you're, give me something concrete here. And I think in many ways that's what visualization does in, in situations. It, it makes it real, it makes it concrete, uh, you know, you, you can see it, you can poke at it. Uh, and I think that just helps people understand better, at least it does for me, so... Yeah, well, that's great stuff, folks. So this is just the first of a series in Fireside Chats. Once again, a very big thank you to our friends at SkyTree for putting this all together. I know I've learned a great deal, and uh, I look forward to talking to these experts again in the future. We'll throw some links at you, and we'll give you some, uh, some time to check this all out in your own time. And feel free to share it with your colleagues. We will archive these webcasts. And jump online and send your ideas out there. That's the whole purpose of events like this, to spur creativity and get people talking about stuff. And with that, we will bid you farewell, folks. This, this uh, ends our first fireside chat. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.